Hey everybody, it's Adam Farkas. Welcome to another OD Wire webinar. Thanks for making it out tonight. And tonight is a subject that is near and dear to the hearts of the members of OD Wire. So you may or may not know that OD Wire was actually started by a contact lens specialist, my father Paul, way back when. Um, and he'd been in, uh, you know, doing contact lens since I guess since the 1950s. So I don't want to, I don't want to age you there, Paul. But you know, it's, it's been a long time. So um, he's been doing it really since. Uh, since the soft lens became a thing. Um, and so that's why with OD Wire, when we first got started, contact lenses were always a big part of the discussion. And what's amusing to me, you know, 15 years on since we started the site, back then the discussion was always how difficult multifocals were to fit. And, you know, who, who would have thought that 15 years later we would still be having the same discussion that some people find multifocal fits, and particularly toric multifocal fits, to be challenging. Um, and so that's what this lecture is all about tonight. We're going to hopefully give you some insight um, into how to fit these lenses properly and where you might be uh, running into some problems. Um, and I can't think of a better guy to give this talk tonight uh, than our guest, uh, Dr. Doug Becker, who's been fixated on contacts um, literally his entire professional career. And like me, his father also started in contact way back when um, and specialized in it. And so he sort of took the mantle of that and, and been studying contact his entire career. Um, he's the past chairman of the AOA contact lens and cornea section, past president of the uh, Heart of America Contact Lens Society, and published numerous papers and lectured extensively. And I'm certain most of you have heard him speak before. Um, right now, he's on the Illinois State Board, and he's active in the uh, AOA, AAO, uh, and the National Academy of Practice. And he's in private practice in Belleville, Illinois. So he's you know still in the trenches um, and can give you really practical advice. Uh, before I turn it over to Doug, let me just give you um, some ground rules. Um, you'll see on the right side of your screen, that wonderful little bar that has all the data about the conference. One of those little boxes says questions. Feel free to uh, ask questions during the lecture. Just type them right in that box. I will actually get those questions and um, we're going to hold them aside until the end of the lecture. But if you have any problems, feel free. Just, you know, go right ahead and ask. Um, and uh, and we'll go from there. So I guess with all that said, Doug, why don't you take it away? Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody tonight. And I hope we uh, can hold your interest for the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour. Now, the topic is tor toric multifocal contact lenses. And do they really work? And let's see if I can get it to advance. There we go. Um, you know, what's the normal clinical frustration with it? Well, you know, you take the box lenses, the pre-made lenses, and you put them on a patient, and you choose the one, obviously, that's your favorite, the one you think is going to work the best for the patient. And right away, what does the patient do? They say, well, you know, it's okay at distance, but it's not okay at near. So you give them more plus because that's what you can do with these ready-made lenses. And then they're going, well, the, you know, the near is a little bit better, but now I can't see distance. So you keep wobbling back and forth trying to take care of both. And you're really limited in what you can actually do. Every time you do one thing, you've messed up something else. And so, you know, you go from lens to lens and you keep trying another one and then you keep trying another one. And finally, three months later, you're about had it with that patient. They've about had it with you. You know, we've all been there. We know how it works. And so there had to be a better answer to that. And Specialized Contact Lens Company, as a company, really understood our frustration. And they knew that asigmatic presbyopes wanted to be able to wear contact lenses without having to rely so heavily on, uh, you know, on some sort of lenses, you know, that you would use over the top. Let me see, this is not advancing. Let's see if we can get to go there. There we go. Okay. There we go. So, they developed a lens, as you can see on the screen here, um, that was based on looking at everything that was out there, trying to put the best of all the world together. And this is the design that they came up with. Now, the big deal on this lens design is that it has a near, it has an intermediate, it has a distance. But if you decide to do it the other way around, you can do a distance in the center, the intermediate, and the near. And you have complete control as to how big you want to make that near center, that near section, the intermediate area, or the distance area. And, you know, obviously that's all based on the information that you're gathering, that you're harvesting from your patient. 
And so you're listening to what your patient's needs are, and you're going to alter these designs or what they need. If they need more near, you give them more near. If they need more intermediate, you give them more intermediate. It's what your patients need. And so the uniqueness of this lens is the ability to customize it as you need or as your patients really need. Now, this is called the, um, it's the Specialized Multifocal Simulator. And what you can do with this is you put the patient's pupil size in, you put the ad in, and you can simulate designing the multifocal lens, and it will give you an impression of what the patient will see. Now, this simulator is very impressive to patients. If you bring it up on your, on your computer in your, in your office, for instance, as you're, as you're examining the patient, and if you use it properly, it, it becomes not just a multifocal simulator, but a real multifocal stimulator in your practice because it's, it's a real wow factor. But the really amazing thing about it is that you can actually change things on it and simulate how that patient will see. So you design it, you put it up, and this is you know, not on the patient, but actually sitting there in front of them. You can adjust the thing to adjust it to make it do what you need it to do. Uh, hey, Doug. Could I yep. stop you there for a second? We're getting sure. clicking from your mic. I was wondering maybe, like, I don't know if you're running into it or if it's too close to your face, but we're getting this clicking noise. How about now? Uh, let's see. Try to say something. How about now? Is it uh, clicking now? Nope. Sounds good. Okay. We'll try to keep it more stable. And I'm having trouble getting this to advance. Okay. There we go. Now, let's go back to the specifics on the lens itself. You have a near center. That's full power for near. It's whatever you want it to be. So when you do the exam, you figure out what the patient needs. You know, so we're talking full sphere, full cylinder, whatever axis you need, and the ad that you need. And so you figure out what it is you need, and that's what goes into this, and that's what this lens is. And then you start listening to what the patient needs, and that's where you'll alter the near zone, the intermediate zone, and the distant zone, based on pupil size, of course, but also on the patient needs. And let's go to the next one here. There we go. Now, if you look at this, this has this is a minus 250 in the center. A minus three, minus 350, minus four. So what this is, this is a minus four power for distance with a plus 150 add, which then, of course, translates to a minus 250. So the 250 is a solid reading area. The minus four is a solid distance area. And then between the 250 to the four and those dotted lines, that's where the progression works, or the atheric part works. So it progressively goes from the distance down into the center to the reading. Now, this is a near center zone of 2.0 and a peripheral zone of 3.5. Now, one of the things that you need to realize right away is that outside ring, it doesn't really matter how large it is. It matters how big the pupil is at that particular time because you're, you can only utilize what the patient can utilize, and that's the size of the pupil. So you have to keep all of that in mind when you're actually designing this, this blend. The... The other thing to think about is, you know, if the patient says they need more reading or they need more distance, you know, you know, think of it as areas, you know, and it's the old go back to fifth grade, you know, areas equal pi r square. So when you have a two millimeter zone in the center, you know, just throw that into the area of pi r square. And that's so that's a 3.14, of course, square millimeter area. And then in this particular case, the 3.5, you would do the same thing. And then you deduct, of course, the three millimeters. And so you end up with about six millimeters in the intermediate zone. And then if the pupil is opening up all the way, the distance zone would actually be about three millimeters too. So in this scenario right here, you have the majority of that lens, as you can see, in the intermediate area. So that would be perfect for somebody who's on a computer screen all day long. They would love this lens. So, but if you have somebody who needs to drive, then you're going to take that second outside ring, where right between the 350 and four, and you would minimize that. You would change that. You would give them, therefore, more distance, and you're not really losing any near. So that's the beauty of this kind of a design, is that you can do what needs to be done to enhance the vision 
without cheating on the powers, which is what we've been doing in the past. Now, let's take a look at this. This particular, um, this is two different patients, but we're gonna have the same 2.0 near center zone with a 3.5 peripheral zone and an add of 1.75. Well, if that was a stable lens where I couldn't change anything, if it worked on one eye, it's certainly not gonna work on the other eye. You know, there's no way that it's gonna work on both of those eyes with the pupils being that different. So if we put that into the simulator, okay, this is the 4.0 obviously on the top and the 5.6 on the bottom. This is just two different patients. So let's take a look at the bottom one first. The patient with the larger pupil, the 5.6, with that same design, that's the plus 175, the 2 center with a 3.5 peripheral zone, you have a 5.6 millimeter pupil on that first patient, the one on the bottom, and the distance is really pretty good. They would probably be happy with that distance because their pupil is opening up wide enough to get out into that peripheral zone. However, in this case, the near suffers pretty drastically and they probably aren't gonna be happy with that. If we look at the top one with the 4.0 millimeter pupil, the distance is not near as good as the bottom, but it's reasonably good. And then all the way through in the intermediate, it's reasonably good. And then it gets down to the near and it's really pretty good there. And so you can see the difference of just the pupil sizes that would happen. Now keep in mind too, that this is gonna occur to a degree all day long as the patient goes from a bright room to a dark room, you know, goes inside, goes outside, all of that, you're gonna have pupil size changes. And so you have to kind of think that through with each patient. You know, you have to understand how big their pupil is or measure it and how small it's gonna get, and then what it is through most of the day. Now, let's take a look at this particular one. And <clears throat> we're going to just change, we're gonna take the 5.6 and we're gonna redistribute the multifocal optics. So it's the same power, we're not changing anything there, but this is the before and it's on the bottom, just like before, the distance is really good the near not so good. So we changed it from a two millimeter center zone with a three five peripheral zone. And we just opened up the center a little bit to 2.5 and we changed the peripheral zone to five. And you can see the difference that it made. The distance you lost a little bit, not a lot, but you lost some, but it certainly enhanced the near. And, you know, if you look at this, you could, you know, somebody might say, well, could you do the before on one eye and the after on the other eye and kind of give them the best of both worlds. Sure, that's the beauty of this is you can order however you want it. They don't have to match. You can do whatever it takes to make that particular patient happy. And this particular scenario here, between the two, if you only had to choose one, the patient would probably be fine with the top one, wouldn't be fine with the bottom one because they'd have to be putting readers on, but you could certainly mix and match if you wanted to. There we go. Now we're gonna do some clinical comparisons. We're gonna talk about fixed optics, which would be you know, any of your box lenses versus a custom optic. So these are the K readings. This is an actual case, um, you know, moderately high hyperope with uh, against the rule of stigmatism and a pretty full ad. So plus four, minus 150, acts as 100-ish with a plus two and a quarter ad, as you can see. And the design we're gonna use is gonna be a near center design, 2.0 near center zone, surrounded by a four millimeter peripheral zone. And of course the two and a quarter ad, because that's what you wanted. So we throw that into the simulator. And the chief complaint of this obviously is that left-hand side, poor distance vision. And that translated to about 2050 vision and the patient really couldn't function with that. So you've got to change something. So, you know, in a fixed design, what can you change? Well, you can't change the size, you can't change the design, you can't change the annulars, you can't change really anything but power. So you do an over refraction and always the concern when you're doing an over refraction with multifocals is that the patient starts sucking up a lot of minus. Well, what you're really doing is neutralizing the reading area. And so what you end up doing is you increase the quality of the vision for distance, but it wipes out the near vision. And so again, you know, you're right back to where you started. 
you know, before they were better at distance, they couldn't see, or they could see near, but they couldn't see distance. Now they see distance, but they can't see near. Neither one is going to be acceptable to the patient. So what about redesigning the optic with a custom lens? So you're going to place more distance optics over the pupil by decreasing the peripheral zone. So you've got three areas to kind of steal area from. And in this case, we're going to take it away from the peripheral zone. And it improved the vision, as you can see on this left-hand side here where the arrow is. It increased it from 2050 to 2025. You combine that with 2025 in the other eye, and typically the patient is very functional and very happy with that. So we didn't cheat. We didn't, you know, add more minus, add more plus. We didn't do anything. What we did was we altered the design, stole a little bit of that intermediate area away from the intermediate and actually put it into the area that we needed to increase the distance. And by doing that, it changes the whole overall optics of the lens. Now we're going to talk about a three-step fitting uh, process. You obtain the patient's measurements and let the specialized design trial lens. So you actually are going to design a lens, order a lens, and you're going to get that lens in, and that's going to be your first lens. That's going to be the one that you'll refine. So you do need, you know, good K's or good topography. You need a very accurate manifest refraction. You, you really need to know the ad powers and how that patient is going to use those lenses. And you do need an accurate pupil size. Um, we spend a lot of time measuring pupils in the office, you know, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, we, one is we use a neuro optics. It's a uh, uh, infrared instrument. It does it automatically by putting it over the patient's uh, pupils. You can do it in the dark. You can do it in the light. Uh, we've got a Colvard Oasis pupilometer. I'm not pushing these instruments at all, but there are things that work. That's another infrared uh, pupilometer. That one you have to manually do it. But there's a lot of different ways to do it. Even, you know, taking time with a PD ruler, you know, you can take your direct ophthalmoscope, reduce the lighting in the room, and, and use your direct ophthalmoscope from about two feet away in a, in a pupilometer, in a, just a pupil stick or a, uh, any kind of a ruler. So there's a lot of ways to take accurate pupil size. It's just that you have to take the time to do it. And if you don't, it'll come back at you later. Now, the second step is to evaluate lenses on the eye and decide whether or not they're fitting properly or collaborate with the consultation line. And then if everything is working well, then you're going to order a, an annual supply. <clears throat> now, when do you want to fit this? Well, certainly the obvious one is the presbyopic the astigmat because we're so limited on really what's out there other than there's, you know, a very minor or very few lenses that are available with both toric and um, and multifocal, and this particular lens is available any way you want it. If you do use a box lens and you're not getting uh, optimal results, obviously you're going to start going into a lens like this. And then really anything that's out of the ordinary, if the, if the eye is a really large eye, a small eye, a very steep eye, a flat eye, you know, the, you can tell that the pupil is decentered. Just something is different about it. Very large pupils, very small pupils. You know, basically, as we get older, we all realize the pupil gets smaller. But you'll have a patient that'll be, you know, 65, 70 years old, and they'll have a four and a half to five millimeter pupil, very active yet. Um, you'll have sometimes young people in their mid 40s that will have very small pupils. So, you know, all of the standard lenses out there are based on just averages, and not everybody is average. So, and of course, there is, of course, gas perm lenses, but even like my office, which has been around a long time, my father started with the sclerals back in the 40s, and we, you know, have had just, you know, years and years and years of buildup of patients wearing gas perm lenses. Well, every year it's less and less patients, obviously. And so, and, and as far as brand new fits and gas perms that aren't specifically for a problem, you know, there just aren't as many of those anymore, at least in my office. Now, what's the pitfalls of other toric multifocal lenses? Well, it's just we've talked about. One design, no matter how good it is, it's just not going to fit across the board for everybody. Your limitations on what you can do to alter it, again, that's going to be power because that's really all we can do. Um, some of them have, you know, just two ads 
uh, very limited choice there. And so what's the first thing you do when they don't at, when they don't read well is you start doing a modified monovision. Um, and, and a lot of times what you end up with is a very expensive monovision that you probably should have been just doing monovision for that patient if you're not gonna go to a custom lens. And then of course, limited base curves and diameters. And with any of these lenses, think about how these lenses are structured. You've got a central zone, whether it's distance or near, there's a central zone surrounded by an intermediate zone, surrounded by a distance zone or near if you flip it. Well, if it's not centered, it's not gonna work. And so it has to center over that line of sight. The custom multifocals, again, you can alter anything you want. If you wanna do near in the center, intermediate distance, or distance in the center, intermediate and near, you can do that. You can put a near center in one eye, a distance center in the other eye. You can flip them however you want. It's really kind of WW, it's whatever works and is uh, successful for that patient. <laughs> now let's go through some troubleshooting. If the initial lens performance acceptable, then dispense it and allow the patient time to adapt. You know, you're gonna have to explain to them how simultaneous vision works. And the first thing I say to my patients is, the way you got to the office, you used simultaneous vision because you weren't staring at your windshield when you drove your car to my office. It had killed itself. You know, they were looking through a windshield at everything out into the distance. And that's simultaneous vision. They were looking through the windshield, looking out at distance. It, that's a learned process. So this is something that's gonna take a little bit of time for them to adapt to. So what I wanna see in the office on the day of the dispense, the initial dispense, is reasonably good vision. And I explained to them, in a couple of days, it'll get better and it'll keep getting better. And it may take a week or two, depending on how fast they adapt. Now, early on, when, when we were first working with these custom lenses, um, what, was, what, we, what I found in my office, what we were doing, is we would design the lens that we thought was the best one. And then as soon as the patient would complain about something, we'd change it and then we would change it again and we would change it again. And then about a month or month and a half down the line, we'd finally be in the third or fourth lens and we'd look at it and it was the exact same design that we started initially. It was just a matter of adaptation and we chased our tail. So we've, we've learned to tell the patient, just take some time, be patient with it. You know, it took 50 years to get to this point for you. It's not gonna take one or two days. It's gonna take a week or so for you to really adapt to this lens. Now, if an exchange is needed, the consultation line will need some information. They're gonna know how, they wanna know about the fit characteristics. Again, think about doing an over K, take a good look at it with your slit lamp, to make sure it's centered. You're gonna, you're gonna need to know distance visual acuity with both eyes. You're gonna need near visual acuity, both eyes. Over refraction results, you know, do they make sense to you when you do an over refraction? You know, if you're throwing in a minus 175 right away, you know you're neutralizing the reading portion. So is it a minus 50 or plus 50 over it? Is it a small amount over it? That makes sense and that you can alter. Listen to what the patient's chief complaint is. You know, there's a difference between a patient that says, you know, I, I work on a computer and the patient that spends eight to 12 hours on three screens all day long. So you have to kind of analyze what it is that your patient is doing all day long and analyze their complaints and then explain to them what can be modified to, to improve their result. So evaluate the fit first, that's number one. If it's optimal, then you go down to two. If it's not, don't go to number two because you've got to correct the fit first. If it's not fitting properly, if it's, if, if it doesn't have good limbal coverage, if it's not, if it's not central, if it's a toric lens and it's rotating, that won't work. If it's a toric lens and the patient comes in and says, you know, it's good one minute and bad the next, well, you know that that lens is torquing with blinking and that's not going to work. So you have to stabilize that lens. Um, you know, and you can walk through with consultation. They may want to go with a larger lens. If they go with a larger lens, is it going to be aligned properly or does it rotate? And if it does rotate, is it a stable rotation where you just have to adjust the powers or is it moving? So it has to be a good fit, number one. And then you have to assess the, the visual acuities and the distance and the near. 
record the binocular acuity first, get that down, both at distance and at near, you know, do it with the proper lighting. And then if there are issues, then start looking at one eye versus another eye and try to figure out why one eye is seeing better than the other eye. Make sure that your refraction was solid. Now that sounds, you know, like, you know, is he kidding, you know? But it's amazing how many, you know, mid to late 40 page presbyopes come in. And if you buy into what your auto refractor said, or you buy into what they came walking in with, with their glasses, sometimes you're tricked. Um, I always do a retinoscopy. Um, and, and if I suspect that it's a latent hyperope yet, I'll do a cycloplegic retinoscopy on them and a, and a retin, and a, uh, manifest refraction, you know, with, with, uh, with cycloplegia. And what I'm doing is I want to know what that maximum is. And then I will start pushing the plus on that patient. You know, you can look at the lens and certainly if it's torqued 20 degrees, you've got a problem. So you've got to look at it and see if there's any cross cylinder effect. Is there, you know, is it variable? You have to go through that whole fitting. Um, when you're getting, when you're dealing with a multifocal toric lens, doing a spherocylinder cylinder over refraction is a bit tricky. You have to get the patient to really ignore the reading part in order to analyze it. And it's, it's a little bit more of a challenge to do that. Um, you know, I'll look at the alignment of the little marks on the, at the three o'clock and the nine o'clock, the little marks, and I will see, you know, how aligned they are. And then you look at the amount of cylinder they are and just mentally decide whether or not, if it is torqued, if that's going to make a, a, a problem for the vision. Number, the fourth thing is confirm the pupil size. That's probably something that many offices really don't take time to do. They really just look at the pupil and assume that it's about, you know, whatever they say, 3035, whatever. And, you know, they really need to accurately measure that to see what it is. If the patient is soaking up minus, again, make sure that they're not just neutralizing the reading part. You know, with the near vision, you know, you have to really understand where that patient is working. You you don't want to overplus them. You don't want to underplus them. You know, you want to make it just right. And so you have to find out where they're spending most of their time. Um, again, you are the one that gets to adjust the amount of area that's needed for near or needed for distance. So that's the area that you're really going to look at closely, and that relates directly to the pupil size. Now, there are different things that you can do. If the patient intermediate is, is just not as good as they want, you know, can you cut the powers if you want? You can. You can, again, do whatever you want. What about shadows? Shadows are, again, zone sizes. So you're going to have to probably increase the zone size. If you have a shadow at distance, you're going to need to give them then in this particular design more peripheral zone. So you might want to decrease the intermediate zone or decrease the near zone. Again, think of it as just kind of property or, or land. You're decreasing one to improve the other one or you're, you know, changing one to help the other one. So it's a plus and minus. Uh, arrangement all the time. Now, what happens if they're doing reasonably well and this happens, they see in your office 2020 at distance, they see J2 up close and you think, okay, this is a home run, but they're still complaining. Well, sometimes patients don't do as well in, a, in an aspheric optic. So there is the specialized bifocal, which basically the bifocal is the same lens, just taking out the intermediate area. What it does allow you to do is it gives you an, a larger area for distance, a larger area for near to be divided up. Rather than dividing it into three different zones, you're only dividing it into two different zones. And just like the, um, the multifocal lens, you can do a center near surrounded by distance or a distance surrounded by near. And the smaller the pupil gets, when you get up into pa patients that are in their 60s, and the pupils are getting pretty small, sometimes there's just not enough room to use an aspheric type design or a three zone design. So the bifocal really is, is my choice on many of these. 
And also, even on young patients that are, let's say, 45, 46, that still have a good accommodative ability, you can put a bifocal on them, just don't overplus it, and they'll use their own accommodative system to be able to focus at different areas. So you want to make sure you give them enough so they can see their computer screen and then make sure they've got enough accommodative flexibility to bring it in to the 16 or 18 inch area. And so you've got a lot of versatility with these lenses. Now let's take a, a, a case point here. This is a ProClear multifocal lens. In the right eye, it's a multifocal, ProClear multifocal. In the left eye, it's a ProClear multifocal torque. And the patient got 20-30 with effort at distance and at near. The chief complaint, practitioner reported that the patient complained of comfort and vision issues, particularly near vision at work. <clears throat> and this is the K reading, uh, standard 44-ish by uh, 45 around there. Uh, HVID is a little bit smaller than normal, 11.5. Pupil size is 4.0. Refraction is minus 3, minus 50. And with the rule, and the other one is a minus 4, minus 1, both 175 add. So a small amount of a uh, cylinder in the right eye, a little bit more in the left eye. And if we go back to the previous, they had been wearing a spherical in the right eye and a toric in the left eye. So we got a 50 and a, and a 1 in the cylinder. So with the specialized multifocal lens, we didn't ignore the minus 50 cylinder. We prescribed it. That will affect the vision. Um, it'll make it clearer. The other thing that I like about if I if I can, I would prefer um, two toric lenses. There is a little bit of prism base down, and some patients, even with one prism base down, will realize that there is a, a bit of a hypertropia kind of thing going on. It's a little bit of asthenopia can set in, and so they'll adapt to it, but it's a little easier if both eyes have that same prism. So in this case, the base curves are both 8 O's, uh, the size was 14.4. That was done uh, with the arc length design um, on the computer. And then full powers with a full app. And the choice was given, which was a 2.0 near zone and a 3.5 uh, peripheral zone. Visual acuity is a distance with 2020 minus at distance, 2015 at near. And an annual supply was ordered. So, again, a home run. Now, this is a transition from toric to toric multifocal. 48-year-old um, female, she just was tired of wearing readers and wanted to try multifocal contact lenses. Uh, K readings are as such, a little bit of, you know, a little bit of a flat eye. Uh, Relatively high hyper, you know, about a plus eight with two doctors a cylinder uh, with the rule and a plus two add. Her pupil size was 3.5. Again, run through the computer. We end up with an 8.5, 14.8 in the right eye and an 8.7, 14.7 in the left eye. And full powers, vertex out with full add. And the choice was a 1.8 millimeter near zone and a three point millimeter peripheral zone. You, the practitioner inserted the lenses, let them settle down, and the patient was just immediately happy with the results, you know, attaining, you know, 2020 at distance or 2020 minus at distance and 2025 at near could function at distance at near intermediate and was just, you know, elated with the kind of results that she got. Now, with this lens, if you want, you can take either one of the lenses, whether it's the aspheric design, the multifocal, or you can take the bifocal design, and you can do an enhanced monovision. Um, again, patients that are in their 60s with small pupils, I do that all the time. Um, a lot of times when the pupils are small, like I said, I will use a bifocal. And if you think about it, the enhanced monovision, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take let's say they're right eyes, and a lot of times what I'll do is I'll do a, a center near, grounded by a distance, 
and the majority of the lens is going to be for distance in that, let's say, the right eye dominant eye. The left eye, I'll flip the design so it's distance in the center surrounded by near. Now, when the patient walks outside and they've already got, let's say, a 2.2 or 2.4 millimeter pupil, and that pupil closes down, well, they can see distance well, at least with the left eye, with that little bitty pupil. And then at night, when they're driving and the pupil may open up to, you know, 3.0 or 3.2 or 4, that pupil opens up and then the dominant eye actually goes out into more of the periphery. And as it opens up, it, it has more of the distance area in front of it. And that's the eye that they're going to use. So no matter what type of a lighting situation in, in that type of a scenario and that type of a design, a lens will work. Now, if they have a little bit larger pupil, then I'll think about a multifocal and do the exact same thing. Again, I'll flip it. I'll put a distance in the center of one and near in the center of the other one. Uh, monocular patients are always a challenge. You have to make sure that they can do everything they need to do, especially night drive and daytime driving. But, you know, again, this lens offers you the ability for the monocular patients to see both distance and at near. Now, the off-label uses, there's a lot of uh, talk about that going on right now. Um, probably for about the last three to four years or three and a half years, we've been trying myopia control with it. And really, if you think about it, what we're doing with the lens is we're kind of mimicking the shape of the cornea that you know, results from a CRT or orthokeratology lens. You know, we're, but with the lens, what we're doing is we're correcting the center section for the distance. And then we have a ring of power on the outside, which again, it kind of mimics the shape of the cornea. So what I've been doing is uh, on kids that are progressively myopia and they don't want to do orthokeratology, one of the options that we offer them is a, what is an attempt at myopia control with this type of a lens. And I just tell the parents up front, look, this is way too new to know whether it is to work, but the, patient, the, the child's increasing in nearsightedness every year. You know, here it is. We'll draw it out on a little graph form. We'll show them the increases. And I explained to them one of the options we would have if they don't want to do CRT orthokeratology is the lens. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a six millimeter zone in the center for distance. So the kids really see no different with that lens than they do with any other lens. But I'll put a ring on the outside, which is going to be a one millimeter ring all the way around. And it is a plus three or plus four. I'm doing now plus fours. I did plus threes for a while. And seemingly, anecdotally, we've seen to we seem to have had success with this. And so it certainly is an exciting thing to think about. And the worst case scenario is the kid just keeps increasing like they did before, and you really didn't help them. Um, <clears throat> another area that that received quite a bit of uh, discussion anyway in the last year is whatever you want to call it, but hyperopia management. And what I've used it on is a number of kids that are you know, near Plano or maybe a plus 50 or one in one eye, but they're a plus five in the other eye and with cylinder maybe. <clears throat> and what we'll do with that eye is the same thing. The center section is going to be corrected for whatever hyperopia they are. And we'll cycloplegia them obviously and, and see what their maximums are. And so in the center of the lens is going to be what they need to enhance their vision as good as we can do. And then it's going to have a ring on the outside of a minus three and or a minus four, if you want, but a minus three on the outside. And the thinking on it is that the, that will take, again, a projection in the peripheral rays of light. So this peripheral defocus that is the buzz in orthokeratology today is focusing behind the eye. And again, I tell the parents that this is way too early to tell whether this would work. And if it does work, it'll be a miracle. And we're going to be so excited for them. But it is going to be certainly, you know, I, if we fit them with a lens, which is what we're going to have to do anyway, because they're not going to be able to wear that big of a differential between the two eyes. They can't do it in glasses. You know, we're going to fit them with contacts anyway. So let's try a lens that maybe will change the shape of that eye. We don't know. There's a lot of activity going on all over the world right now with this. And we'll see in another couple of years whether or not that works. So there are some off-label um, uses that if you use your imagination, Really, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. I would just make sure you explain to the parents up front that, you know, where we stand with that stuff right now as far as clinical evidence. 
Now, let's talk about something that's really important also that, again, with a custom lens you can do, and that's line of sight vision. And this, you know, unless you know about this lens, you probably um, don't know much about this. But let's look at this particular patient, and it, it's kind of self-explanatory. 45-year-old Presbyterian patient fit with two sets of specialized 54 multifocal lenses. The first one would be a standard type of lens, a standard optic lens. The second set, the optics were decentered nasally a half a millimeter. Yeah, these are the specs, uh, basically 43-ish by 42, a minus 5, a minus 450 with an add of 150. Now, the first one um, had the center optics, and it's the same exact design. The second one had optics that were de nasally decentered. Okay, this is an over topography. And if you if you look closely, you can see where the line of sight is pointing to a little um, plus sign, a little gray plus sign, if you can look closely. That's the patient's line of sight. And you can see where the centration with that lens, you can see how it's off centered. So the lens is reasonably centered on the eye. It's just that the line of sight is decentered. And I'm trying to get it to advance now. Okay, for some reason. There we go. Whoops. Of course, too. Okay, now this is the line of sight you can see right there. You can see the distance is altered. And so it's the right eye is 0.49 temporal, left eye is 0.3 temporal. So the difference was one was just centered, so it was just standard. The second one, the optics were offset to align with the line of sight. So asking the patient then how they like their vision, let's say, um, looking at the 2030 chart at distance, the, the green is the offset, the, the blue is the standard lens, the centered lens, and you can see across the board, but at the 2030 level, the 2040 level, reading a newspaper, looking at his cell phone, you know, looking at a medicine bottle, looking at a phone book, everything across the board increased drastically. And that, you know, tends to reason, of course, you know, anytime that you're centering the optic, you know, over the pupil's line of sight, they have to see better. And this is, again, something that's available with a custom lens like this. Now, what is your the specialized promise to your practice? Well, high-performing lenses, they have incredibly repeatable reproducibility. So the first lens and the fourth lens are gonna be the same. We rarely would ever see a problem there. And we've been at this with Specialized for more than 10 years. Um, it's really nice. I mean, we've all seen when we've worked with some of the box lenses and in the scenario that I gave you about a half an hour ago, where you're on your sixth or seventh lens, you're in the third company by now, you just keep trying, you keep trying, you look at the, you look at the patient's chart and they've had about 15 lenses at this point. And finally you find one that they're reasonably happy in. And then they ask for their prescription so that they can get it online. We all see it. If we don't think it's happening in our practice, well, then we're not watching because it is. And that's just part of it. Well, one of the nice things about these custom lenses is that they're not online. They can't get them online. So they're pretty much stuck getting them from you. It is a guaranteed fit and you don't have to send anything back. You just have to call them. Just call Specialized and say, okay, we tried the first lens, tried the second lens, the patient lost interest or I lost interest. You know, just take it off the account and they do it. You don't have to box them up. You don't have to send them off and then check to see if you're gonna get credit. You know, none of that goes on. It's just, they just give you credit right away. The majority of the lenses will receive in three days, um, guaranteed three to four days. Uh, I have put them in the position of getting these lenses overnight. So we're calling it, you know, noon and they're shipping them out that day. Now there's a premium charge for that, I guess, but uh, 
we messed up and, you know, everybody does it. And so you, you know, sometimes you have to do that because the course is the patients that's leaving for Europe in two days. Those are the ones that you forgot to order two weeks ago. And so they can get it to you even faster. I'm sure they're at the other end saying, don't say that, but they've done it for me. Um, they're fully warranted against defects, tears, anything. And so it, it, it will be the easiest company. If you've not worked with them, it will be the easiest company you've ever worked with. This is the, um, the specification. It comes in three different materials, 59, 54, 49%. Um, I usually use the 54% for almost everything. Uh, I do have patients that are still stuck in the annual lenses. They just, you know, they've worn these things for the last 40 years and by gosh, that's what they're going to do. I'll use the 49% lens on them. Um, I used to use a lot of the 59%. I really don't use a lot of them anymore. I find I wear the lens myself. I don't find any difference between the 54 and the 59%. These lenses do not dehydrate, so I put them on first thing in the morning, and I have very long days, just like most of you. And so mine are on all waking hours. Um, one of the other things that I'm going to throw out that's not in the lecture is I've had, um, you know, a Conan cell check, and again, I'm not pushing products, but we've been able to look at spec spectacle microscopy in the practice for, gosh, probably 20 years. And we do cell checks on every contact lens patient that walks in the door, bar no, I mean, every one of them. And so I watch the endothelial cells very, very closely. And as you know, if the fit of the lens is improper or if there's not enough oxygen for that particular patient, you know, you're going to end up with all kinds of, you know, polymorphism with the uh, endothelial cells. And we watch that closely with the specialized materials, the hexafilcon materials. We just don't have problems. So we do watch every lens. You know, there are some high DK lenses out there that fit rather tight that will give you some problems. But unless you have a, you know, unless there's a means of checking specular microscopy, you wouldn't know it. So that's never been an issue with this lens. Um, it comes plus or minus 25 diopters. Uh, we've done some very, very high powers like that. In fact, the very, very first one we did 10 years ago was in that category. It was in the, in the mid plus 20s with a lot of cylinder on a young kid and it changed his life. And so these lenses are just phenomenal lenses to work with. You can order more prism if you need face down for a patient. You can go up to four diopters prism base down, but it, it does become a thick lens. And it, again, everything is customized. And again, There we go. And that's their phone number and uh, email and their website. And um, you can actually see the simulator that I talked about on the website. You can bring that up and look at it and play with it. It is, it is really a hoot to play with with the patient. Staff loves it. It's, a, it's an incredible tool, um, just a marketing tool. And like I said, it's not just a simulator. It's a simulator for you as far as being able to show patients what to expect. It's a, it's a fun tool to have. It takes just minutes to do with the patient. You kind of give them an overview of what you're trying to do with the lens. So I think I'm going to turn this back over to Adam, and I guess he'll moderate if there's any questions or at all. We're right at uh, 50 minutes now. All right. Well, great, Doug. Thank you so much. And uh, so um, there are a huge number of questions here, but fortunately uh, we have extra help as well. Um, so we have the executive staff from um, from Specialized here with us tonight. So we have Michelle Walsh, Lindsay McCorkle, and Corinne Andrew. And so uh, these folks are actually going to be helping us out a little bit. And I'm going to unmute them because I think some of these questions are probably best directed at them. So, so guys, uh, why don't I just ask you a couple of these questions? You can just jump in and, and uh, let me know who you think uh, has the best answer. Okay. And Lindsay, I think you just sent me a note a few seconds ago. Uh, do you want to sort of tell everyone what it was about? Sure. Yeah, I'd be glad to, Adam. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for having us. Thanks for joining us. Um, so just a little bit ago when um, Dr. Becker was talking about offset optics, the case that he presented um, was from a poster that, that we did at the Global Specialty Lens Symposium last year in Las Vegas. Um, so I sent Adam a message to let the audience know that offset optics 
um, are not currently available. Um, we are in the last phase of testing. Uh, we've gone through uh, three different phases. Uh, we've completed phase one and phase two, and we're currently in phase three. If phase three goes well, then hopefully you'll uh, see this technology being launched in, uh, and uh, promoted here very soon in the near future. Um, Adam, was there any other questions specific in regard to the case or the offset optics in, in general? I haven't seen anything about the offset optics, although now that I have you here, um, can I ask you a, a question that I think would probably be directed at you? So someone asked, um, what's the cost, the typical cost of a lens and the, the, the typical retail price that you would charge a patient? Sure, great question. So the lens is $40 per lens. Um, majority of practitioners, due to the custom nature of the lens, replace it on a quarterly replacement every three months. Um, for So that would bring a four-pack to about $160 which would be 320 years supply, both eyes to the practitioner, their cost. Um, to replace it bi-monthly or monthly, a six pack would be 240, and then both eyes would be 480 years supply, the practitioner's cost. And then we hear typical markup is anywhere from one and a half to two times uh, the practitioner's cost. And that obviously varies based on geographical location, socioeconomics of the area. Um, that's what we hear from um, practitioners uh, from our customers. Uh, Dr. Becker may be able to chime in on that a little bit as well from his perspective. I don't know if he feels uh, like he could add anything there, but that's what uh, we hear uh, from our customers. Great. And Doug, uh, does that sort of uh, fit with the picture that you have in your practice? Well, you know, we'll stay away from any kind of uh, talking about prices. That's uh, something that doctors can't really talk about. Um, you know, you have to just figure out what works for you. But keep in mind, these are not available on the internet. Um, you know, what happens, we've been, I've been doing this 10 years, these type of lenses here 10 years. And, um, you know, there's not a lot of competition. You know, it's, it's incredible, but, you know, it's kind of the movement away from anything very sophisticated. You know, so it's, you know, if you're doing these type of lenses, synergized lenses, you know, scleral lenses, any of those kind of things, you can just pretty well figure out what you feel you should charge for these things and then present it as such. Um, so I don't think you get locked into anything. There's, you know, there's not going to be much competition is really what I'm saying. And, um, but you also want to make it so it's, you know, reasonable enough that your patients can do it. So, you know, it's, but I'll, so I'll stay away from pricing, but I'll kind of give you my insight as far as, you know, you can pretty well do what you need to do. Right. And then, Adam, I could chime in a little bit on that, too. I know um, I've, I've spent a lot of time talking to different customers and uh, reaching out. And the one thing that I've heard uh, several times is that due to the specializes warranty policies, so the things that we offer the practitioners in their practices, a lot of uh, practitioners will use that as a way to build loyalty with their patients. And what I mean by that is specialized warranties, all lenses against tears and defects, even supply lenses. Um, so if you have a patient that has a, an issue with a torn lens and say they're in month four of their year supply, they still have three pair of lenses under warranty. You give us a call, we're going to replace that at no lens cost uh, for the patient and for you. And then also um, we have a guaranteed fit program. So anytime during the trial lens fitting process, if you, uh, the practitioner, the patient feels like, you know what, this just isn't working out, the patient doesn't show back up for the fitting all you have to do is call us within 90 days of the last remake or exchange lens. Let us know the patient was not adapt or unsuccessful. You discard of the lenses and we apply a credit to your account for the trial lens cost. So we really try to keep it practitioner friendly um, and really it's focused on successful patient outcomes. Uh, yeah, let me uh, let me talk a little bit on something there too. Um, you know, Lindsay just used the word annuity. This lens truly is an annuity lens. Um, it, it almost reminds me kind of like the good old days of contact lenses where, you know, patients weren't shopping on the internet while they're talking to you, you know, to get, to get a good price type of thing. Um, it just doesn't happen with this lens. And the patients realize it right away that this is a specialty lens. And if they don't, you know, they, we just, we love to give them the contact lens prescription, the specialized contact lens prescription, and they should go home and shop it everywhere they want because it's not available. And so, you know, right away, the second year, you know, if, if it's a sphere, sphere or a sphero cylinder lens, you know, you may not be changing anything. So it's a pretty 
you know, routine exam. And in the multifocal, I spend really more time listening to the patient to see how they've been doing. And if they're still saying, oh, it's perfect, I don't change a thing. And, you know, it's pretty well a done deal. And they're going to order a year's supply and it's done. The patient that comes in and says, you know what, I'm, I'm really starting to struggle with near. Well, open up the near a little bit or give them more plus if that's what your refraction finds. You know, so you can alter these lenses as the patient ages. And so patients can wear these, you know, pretty well all the way through. I, you know, the specialized group knows that I had a patient that was a lovely patient that passed away last year who was in her 90s wearing these lens, these multifocal or bifocal lenses. Um, you know, so it, as your patient ages, you can alter things in these lenses and you can keep them in these lenses for really ever. And since the lens doesn't dehydrate, it's a very wetted lens, very wettable lens. And it, and it stays on the eye very well as far as dehydration. So it, that isn't an issue. And so, you know, patients are able to wear this lens for long periods of time and for years. So. Great. Great. have a couple of uh, operational questions here, and I'm not sure who's best to answer it. Maybe Corinne can, can help us, um, because I'm sure Corinne's seen a lot of different um, clinicians around the country, um, you know, fit the lens. Um, chair time is always sort of a big issue, uh, at least on ODY, when people talk about multifocal. Can you speak to, you know, sort of what you see with the lens and, and how long a complete case might take? Absolutely. So what we have seen, um, we actually looked at some data to try to find out how long it would be to a patient's success. And when we looked at that data, we found that 71% of patients, of the successful multifocal patients, actually attained that satisfaction within one to two trial lenses. So that tells us that, you know, it's not as difficult to reach that success as we may think. Um, and actually, we re-looked at the data for 2016 and um, found that it was actually up to 78% of the successful multifocal patients attained satisfaction within one to two trial lenses. So as we learn more and grow more um, and get better at the consultation aspect and work with more practitioners, uh, we're, we're seeing that rise. And then I'll chime in a little bit there on Adam at the end of that question. Um, and what I'd, I'd really like to iterate is we've seen from a consultative perspective really it hinges on solid information up front. That one to two trial lenses uh, to success, that's, you know, solid refraction, you know, good fit, and then uh, accurate, accurate pupil size uh, upon initial design of the first trial lenses. So the, the, as we've seen from the presentation, the design is very hinged um, upon correct and accurate pupil size measurement. Right. Let me add something to that, too. Um, I think the, the original question was chair time, and, and what most optometrists are thinking about chair time is initial time that you're spending with the patient on that first day. Hmm. This lens is incredibly quick because I never see the lens on the eye that first day. We're going to design a lens that we think is the absolute perfect trial lens and order it, and it's going to be here in four or five, it'll be here three to four days. So if I'm going to do a box lens that's and not a torch, but just a, a multifocal lens. I'm going to take the one that I think is going to work the best on the patient. Somebody's going to be putting that on the patient. We have to wait for them to acclimate. Then we're going to take acuities. Then we're going to do over refractions. Then we're going to talk to them. And then we're probably going to change lenses and we may end up going to another lens. So there's a lot of downtime with patients when you're dealing with just a regular, simple box lens. With this lens, I'm going to take all the information. I'm going to take the manifest refraction, the topography. I'm going to take the HVID. We're going to take the pupil sizes. We're going to take that information and, and very quickly design the lenses. And that will be the first trial lenses. And then those go on the patient. We wait until they're acclimate. We take acuity. And so we really then refine it from there. So from the chair time, actually these, custom lenses are way quicker than a, a pre-made lens. Right. And, and Doug, how long do you usually let the lens settle before you, you, uh, get the, you know, assess the fit? If we remember to go back in probably 15, 20 minutes, but sometimes they'll sit there an hour because we forgot about them. But, you know, <laughs> um, you know, they're still there. Oh my God. You know, but uh, um, yeah, you know, it, it typically now we'll put the lens on initially or they'll put the lens on. You know, if it's a if it's a toric lens, 
our our patients, if they've worn lenses before, will know how to put the lens on so that it aligns properly. You know, if if it doesn't align properly, in other words, they they put the thing on 180, you know, 90 degrees off, let's say, it's going to take longer to acclimate. So we're going to put it on so that it's pretty well lined up initially, so it doesn't take very long. And so, you know, a couple of hard blinks, 15 minutes later, they're fine. Great. And uh, Lindsay, I have a question for you here. Uh, the, the lens availability outside of the U.S., can Canadian practitioners uh, have access to the lens? Yeah, so that's been a little tough challenge for us due to shipping costs. Um, you know, it's, it's the shipping costs, unfortunately, are a little high, and therefore sometimes it doesn't make it feasible. So we're definitely willing to ship, but the, the shipping cost is quite high. Gotcha. And I guess another question too. We I had a question here that um, you know, with with some of the the larger uh, commercial outfits that people work for, like I have a question here about National Vision, um, and the clinician was told they don't have an account. What do you do in that in that case, Michelle? Do you want to answer that one? Uh, it's dormant here. I can barely hear you. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. sorry. I, no, so that's I okay. The question. Oh, okay. No, it would really depend on, you know, from Michelle, she's our director of sales and marketing, so she may have a little tweak to this, but um, as far as um, like national vision or lens crafters and things like that, if if they're able to set up an account in order, that would be the, the most appropriate method. Sometimes setting up an account can be a little tough. We've had some lens crafter uh, lens crafters, optometrists actually set up accounts in their own name, like create kind of a, a a business entity under their own name, Dr. Joe Smith OD, and order directly um, through themselves with Specialize, and we, you know, ship to wherever they want it shipped to and bill to them. Um, but that can get a little, little convoluted. So, um, if National Vision is open to, you know, discussing things and wanting to open an account with Specialize, we'd definitely be open to that. Cool. So I guess the best thing to do would maybe be to have the clinician contact you, and then maybe you could try to get in touch with the right party. Definitely. And if they can put us in touch with the right person on their end to get an account set up and billing and shipping and all of that, that would be helpful. Excellent. Well, you know what? It, we have a, a bunch more questions here, but it looks like we're running a little short on time. So uh, one question was, where where will this be posted? And the answer is, um, this entire webinar will be up on ODWire probably within the next day or so. Um, and what we're also going to do is, uh, you know, put up the extra questions as well. So right underneath where this video of the show will be there will be more questions and uh hopefully we can get those answered as well and <laughs> one question here about the little prize that we're raffling off um, which was an ipad pro um if you won you'll get an email and we're also going to show the winner um up on od wire so i guess we're running out of time do anyone have any last words doug do you have any anything else you want to conclude with no i think just uh if you have any questions just call specialize and they've got great people that can answer them Excellent. And one, one last thing, Adam, I had sent some links to some um, to learn more about design and prescribing of this lens. So we have an email course that's available. We have a link to a bunch of case studies, as well as um, we have uh, video demos for our multifocal simulator. So um, I can put those in the sign into OD Wire and put those in the show notes as well. And Michelle and I will be around uh, in OD Wire once this gets posted, and we'd be glad to answer any of those questions. All right. Sounds great. So I, I guess Doug, Corinne, Lindsay, Michelle, thank you so much for being here tonight and thank everyone for, for coming on out. And I guess I'll see everyone online. All right. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.